everyone. This is Kathy Mason from Mason Works Marketing on Conscious Business Zone today with an amazing, amazing event um, where we are talking with people that are in the future. They're in Australia, so they're the next day from me. <laughs> and we're talking with someone in Mexico. So today we're going to talk about the real origin hopefully, and give you some insights into the real origin of humanity. And uh, these, the, Stephen and Evan Strong have been working diligently for years on deciphering the original information, the hieroglyphs, and the data that's uh, readily available near them in uh, Australia to give us some insights into our origin. And they've worked with uh, the original peoples of Australia. They've written five books. And um, today we're just gonna see what, what uh, unfolds so that we can find out more information. I'll be learning right along with you on uh, all of this data. So hello, hello, Stephen and Evan. G'day, Kathy. How are you? Hi, hi. Hi, and hi, TJ. Thank you for being here. So Pleasure. where do where do we want to start? I mean, we we've got a theory that the elders of Australia mm -hmm. have rediscovered you've you've rediscovered a hidden history that's the out of Australia theory. So yeah. So do you want to start there? Is that going to be our... Yeah, point? sure. Yeah, we can start with that. Look, it's our belief that Australia was the the central point, the central uh, country during ancient times, and I mean very ancient times. And what we found in Australia is a series of um, anomalous pieces of archaeology that do not fit in. You see, Australia is an interesting um, archaeological case because according to every expert, and I'll use that word loosely, um, they are going to tell us until um, the British came with an invasion fleet, and I'm sure the Americans will be aware of how that works, um, there was nothing here but original people that came from Africa 50,000 years ago, and the, all of the technology was what was called stick, stone, bone, and fireplace technology. So this is the beauty of this. Because it's so locked in, if you find so many different pieces of archaeology that don't fit into that, that particular conventional explanation of humanity, then it calls into question all the stories about humanity because Australia is an interesting offshoot. It's supposed to be around sixty to 50,000 years ago. Two or three Africans decided somehow or other when they got to Indonesia, even though it was 150 k's before Australia, they decided to get onto a boat and just sail off into the yonder and hope that somewhere over the other side there was somewhere to land. Now, I've got to tell you, from a point of view of me being around 60,000 years ago and I'm standing on the shoreline, I'd love to hear what this person said that convinced me to get on the boat. It must have been really convincing. It's going to be good. So that's the theory, and we've all accepted that. And here's the point with this. You've got to understand something. To create a genetically viable population, it can't be one bloke and one woman. It's got to be about 20, which makes this the most sophisticated boat at that particular time, if you believe their story, that ever existed. And the best part is when they got there, forgot, they forgot how to make boats after that, so could never leave. That's what we've been told. And they were stuck inside there. So theoretically, that's the base of it, okay? So what we found over the last 15 years is we have an advantage in this because we started from a different viewpoint. We started from the point of I was given ceremony by probably the, one of the most, if not the most important old way older in this country. And that gave us the right to go virtually anywhere in this country, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And it also gives us a right, and I've even read critiques about us by top archaeologists who say, who admit that none of the original people trust them, but they trust us. And then they say, how can we defend ourselves against them? I'm thinking, well, the advantage is, the simple answer is, get the original people to trust you and they'll tell you the truth, but they won't. So we've come into this from a different point of view. 
We have him come in like a, from an archaeologist who's been funded to find an answer. He's already worked out and then goes on the country and tells people, this is what I'm looking for. Whether the original people will always say the same thing, won't they, Evan? Yes, sir. Yes, boss, whatever you say. Three yes. full, sir. Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, we'll tell you that. And are you gone now? Fine. Now we'll get back to what we're doing. <laughs> So that's been an issue. It's been acknowledged by archaeologists that they haven't got the trust and we have. So what does that give us? It gives us all the things that they wouldn't show them. So we now have an abundance of archaeology that doesn't fit in. We have metal objects, sometimes found four metres beneath the surface. Well, mate, there's no metal here. That's the story. And what's fascinating, in some of those metal objects we found, we've had scientific readouts where it's 24% from a metal not identified on the periodic table on this planet. We have actually three objects at the moment. One's 41%, one's 24%, and one's 0.2 of a percent, all that are registered as nothing, not on the table. So that's the first part. You ask questions and say, well, how can there be metal on this planet? on this particular continent because according to the books it's got to be cooks and it's not because cook and all the people who came after don't work with metal that's not on the periodic table right because that's the ones that are on this planet so what we're finding is a series of different things that have turned up that don't fit in and what's become obvious to us is by the way the story of uh, 60,000 years probably the top, the grandfather of archaeology in Australia that fought doggedly to stop people talking past 40,000 years, did he, Jim Bowler? Yeah. And he, he fought other people who said this could be 60,000 years. He said, no, it's got to be 40. He's now saying 120,000 years. Now, that date comes from Warrnambool, which is in the bottom of Australia. Now, the story is the Africans got here 50,000 years ago and it took about 20,000 years to get down to Victoria. That's 30,000 years. We've got something now 120,000 years that the top archaeologists with the top science, we've seen the science, four different dating techniques were used, all came up at 120,000 as a bottom year. So the whole story about what's happening in Australia doesn't fit in. We found skulls, four, in this country, that are, I've shown it to the top archaeologists in this country, in a, in a, in a, I can't say the university because the government blocked us soon after, we said that is not a hominid and it's not a homo sapien. And he's right, it's neither. But let me tell you about this being. From the eyebrows up, there's nothing. There is no forehead. It goes back from that point at about 180 to 210 degrees and slopes right back down. It has a flask-shaped skull, which is 18 centimetres at the back. Ours is 13, all right? Now, I want the ladies in our group to think just for a second about natural birth, okay. where you're supposed to dilate to 10, and this being at the back is 18. And the best part is this one doesn't have any sutures. So there's no give and take because your child, when they're born, has sutures that aren't even formed together. And when the people we built these, because we've got four of them, I've seen one complete, and we have skull bits from another, were given to us by an academic. The people who were putting this back together, and one of them used to work for the Australian Museum making skulls. He said the same thing. Where are the sutures? This is just not right. We found four of them. The eyes on these beings are 46% bigger than ours. Wow. Brain size, 1,800 cc, we're 13. We're not in the ballpark here. We're right back at the back of the table there. We're not even sitting in the dunce's um, seat there. We're in another class. And the interesting part is <coughs> when you look at the face, and we've got a homo sapien skull, and you put it alongside this one, nothing is the same. Wow. Nothing. The nose is different. The eyebrow, I mean, the nose starts up here. And the nose is much different shape. It's got a triangular shape and we've got a circular shape of our nose cavity there. Nothing about it makes sense. But what is really fascinating is when I was on site, and by the way, the site I've been to, the governor rung me up. And now, by the way, I've been given countless threatening messages to put me in jail because of this. Evan's got a file about this thick of official letters. But what we found was when I was on site once, I, there were bones strewn everywhere because the governor had been there 
And they said, oh, it's just a homo sapien, then closed the site up and told the farmer no one's to know about it. Now, I sat on that for two years, and I won't go through the process of getting there. But when I got there, I picked up the femur bone, which is the hip bone, for those people who aren't sure about that. And I put it up against mine, and it was a perfect fit. And I said to the people alongside, this looks like this being's about five foot ten. That's a fair call. Then I picked up the humerus bone. And this is where the whole story gets interesting, because this is where we know this is not from here. The humerus bone that you've got and I've got from here to the elbow is around about 30. Your basketball, it could be 31, 32, and a gibbon is 35. When I picked this bone up, it came up to here, but there was no elbow joint. Wow. It was 43 centimetres to there, but the elbow joint, I don't know where it was. It could be further down again, but even if it was just next to there, that means it has to be at least 46 which makes that 10 centimetres longer than any hominid on the planet. But here's the fascinating part. That bone was no thicker than one inch at its widest piece. So what I'm looking at with this being that's been found on this continent that no woman in their right mind would give natural birth to. They all say, cesarean, thank you, not touching it. We've got eyes that aren't like ours, a nose that isn't like ours, a chin that isn't like ours, and we've got eyes that are made for nighttime running and a bone that honestly the the the, uh, the bone of the gibbon is about two set, two inches wide this is one this wouldn't work it wouldn't work under the gravity we have today now if the gravity was half of today's then you'd have more muscle more ligament it becomes a functional limb but as it stands on our planet this being could not go out during the daytime be blinded and more to the point, what would it do with the arms? You couldn't play tennis with them. You could basically do nothing with them. So what have we got? And we, by the way, there are four of these. And one of them, we got a university to agree to do an expedition on. And we got an expedition crew, didn't we? We did. And then two days before it started, our government stepped in and called the whole thing off. And we can't do it anymore because the university gets paid by who? The governments. So they stepped in and a professor said, you're not going out there. And it's still out there waiting. We know where the skull is. We have the coordinates, but we can't get out there. So what we're finding when we look around this planet is a multitude in, in this, this particular continent is a multitude of anomalies that can't be explained under any normal situation. So that's the first part of this story that, that we could spend basically the next three or four hours talking about different pieces of archaeology that don't fit in. But where it gets really interesting is that some of this archaeology, and I'm looking at five pieces of them right now, which I'm going to hold up in a sec, they're rocks. And you're going to think, oh, well, rocks, that, that's something that people in ancient times used, so therefore that makes sense. No, it doesn't, because I'm going to hold up five of these rocks right now, and I'm going to show you something about the technology that doesn't fit in. And let's hold up the first one now. That's this one here. And you'll see it's got all these straight lines on one side, and if I turn it around the back, you'll see more. Wow. Uh-huh. Now, with this rock, and we've got about five of these rectangular rocks, it's coated. If you look very carefully, you'll find a white underneath. It's been cut, not chiseled, but cut. Now, I want you to think, ladies and gentlemen, what knife do you have in your kitchen drawer that can cut into a rock as hard as this one and get these straight lines running across and down? Now, I want people to focus on this for a sec because there's a big clue with this. You've heard of the Rosetta Stone, haven't you? Yes. Right. This is the same thing for first language because we work with a person called Dr. Derek Cunningham who measures angles of lines in ancient caves because he believed there was a lot, an ancient language of mathematics, right? So he measured all the angles on this particular rock. And we've got the readout for that. And then what we did was compared it to three other pieces of work he did. One was in Calgary. Now, he measured these rocks to point two decimal points. So it might be 13.61 degrees, right? This is very precise. Okay. Of the 21 rocks in Calgary, 19 of the angles are also on this rock. Wow. That's a bit of a clue. Could be a coincidence, but because don't worry, the naysayers will say that. But then he compared it against the rock that Dr. Samir found underneath the uh, tunnels in Bosnian Pyramid, didn't he? Yeah. And we measured, he measured 15 angles on that rock. 
all 15 are on this rock. Then we compared it with a rock he measured in Germany where there were 10 angles. All 10 are on this rock. Now, what does that tell you? That you go to Germany, to Serbia, to Calgary and Canada and Australia, and we've got a series of rocks that all have exactly the same lines making out exactly the same angles. That could be an amazing coincidence, but here's the point. It's 43 out of 45 scores on this rock. And the two other angles we didn't get here, we got on other rocks. So what we start to see is we're seeing hints that when we read the Bible about the Tower of Babylon, where there was one language, this was the very first language that ever existed. And because it's mathematical, right, you can't have semantics or contradictions. If it's 13.61, that's what it is, and that's what it means. So what we're starting to see with this, just this first rock, is the story of the first language ever written. Now, I will tell you now very quickly what the elder Carno said about this rock. And he gave the dreaming story that goes with this rock, which is just as important. What he told me, we'd had this rock for about two years, hadn't we, Evan? We, yeah, we had. Didn't, he didn't tell us a thing. He's like that all the time. He rang me up one day and he said, that rock. He said, where is it? He said, oh, it's in the house. He said, get it out of the house. For God's sake, it'll kill people. I said, oh, right, okay. And then he said, told me the story. He said, this is the story of Goanna coming to this planet. Original people always talk in totems. And by the way, if you don't know the Goanna, it's the largest lizard in Australia and it's the smartest. Think of a Komodo dragon style. But way yeah. smarter. When you build around here, if you build a chook pen for a, a fox or a dog, it costs you about five, dollars $600. For a Goanna, $3,000. Wow. they will break in. They'll stake the place out and find a way in. And even when we build it, the guy who got in there once still got in there. It's still got in. Two and a half thousand dollars that we paid for it. And the guy had moved in straight away. Oh my gosh. And someone, why did you keep it in there and then sell it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Honestly, it's got claws. No, no, no. You leave them alone. So, Mate, they okay. spread it. No, no like one a picked it. It's a dinosaur. Up. Well, it's about three and a half metres long. It's big enough. It's slightly smaller than the Komodo dragon, but no one picks on a goanna. Honestly, you don't. <laughs> but okay. So what we found, okay, that uh, we've got the story of the goanna coming in a spaceship, right? And then the eagle and the crow fought against that. That's us, our people, our totems. The crow is the wisest bird on the planet, as we all know. It's got... In fact, of all the animals on the planet, the crow has the best, what is it, brain size weight to body, which is 2.9, where 1.9. Where 1.9, a crow is 2.9. And that's why crows don't go near people, because we're too dumb for them. And they don't trust us. And I don't trust us either, so I don't blame them. So what happened once they fought? Then at one stage, the crow realized the Pleiadians, because that's who they are. They had to come. So he joined in with them. And the story is that then the Pleiades and the Crow won. And when they landed in Australia, the, the, um, the eagle had to give something to the goanna because, and he did, he gave him the claws. And what Carno said was he took those claws and then scratched the laws of this planet on this rock. And then he told me at the finish, and believe me, Carno is the expert in Australian old way culture. And he said, then the white fellas took that story and put it on a mountain with a man called Moses and the Ten Commandments which oh. were written into rock with fingers of um, fire working. No, this is laser. This is laser stuff we've got here. Now, this one alone, people might say, yeah, well, the story sounds fine, but I'm not so sure about it. I'm going to hold up another rock of ours now. I want you to look at this one here. Now, that's a core sample, and you'll see there are 29 different angles on there, little, little marks made there, all cut into this. We've had geologists look at this and said that's the finest core sample we've ever seen. It's smooth. It shines. This is thousands of years old. My question is, I don't know what it says, but I know this, that you look at the history books and you try and find a story about a group of people in Australia that could do this to could take this out and then cut, cut into it. The finest lines, sometimes they're so fine, it's like hair width. 
and it's so sharp and consistent. That doesn't fit in either. And then we've got another rock here, this one here I'm holding up now, which is a seven sisters story because it's got two cuts down this way and five running across. And there are about 120 different lines have been cut into it. Wow. And look how deep some of those cuts have been. Time after time when they've done ceremonies. Well, where did that technology come from? This is the problem. We have literally hundreds of these rocks that have been bought on the open market or found by people in Australia and then sent to us. We've never taken a rock off country because if we did, we'd die. So this story, from a technological viewpoint, we can do it with the metal, often that's not even from this planet. We can do it with the skulls that did not come from this planet. And we can do it with the rocks that have technology. In some cases, ladies and gentlemen, we've got rocks here that has technology that we still can't do today. So what that tells us is you've got to remember that Australia was part of a continent in ancient times called Lemuria. Right. Okay. And we know about Atlantis. We know about Lemuria. And, of course, as you probably know, we also have Three rings, nine, nine rings from Lemuria and three from Atlantis. And by the way, the two rings from Atlantis, which are both made from Ori Chalcum, which has never been found anywhere except once by a Roman galleon, those were buried one and a half metres and four and a half metres at the same gold field about five, five kilometres apart, which is on 33 degrees south. That, all of that stuff, does not fit into a normal story about Australia. But it goes further because this technology wasn't limited to Australia. It was found around the world. So what's turning up in Australia, we can't dismiss this and say, oh, it was done with someone with a metal tool. No, no. You told us in the books there was no metal until Mr Cook came with his boats. So that can't be right. And they admit that. So the rule is now, and according to archaeologists in Australia, the way to best fight this, and I've seen it in a paper, is to ignore it. So there is a, a continental in Australia agreement between archaeologists, isn't there, Evan? There is. Yeah. They are all to ignore everything we say and never put it up. Oh, my gosh. Really? Oh, no, honestly, I've got, I've got a paper written by the top archaeologist in this country, and he's got a chapter called Slater and the Strongs, and in it, he makes it clear, number one, we must defend ourselves against these people and the best defence is to ignore them. <laughs> and he's the same person who said in the same paper that none of the archaeologists in Australia have any relationship with the Blackfellas, but we do. He admits that, but then says we should ignore them. And I'm thinking, well, that's a good way to solve your problem, isn't it? We must have found some way to get to talk to them while they'll listen to us. And their solution is, okay, we admit they won't talk to us, so what we'll do now is we've got one group that can talk to them, so let's all ignore them too, eh? But, yeah, we're, we're lucky to have um, someone like TJ with us today because she's um, there are only a few archaeologists we've come across with an open mind. In Australia, TJ was one of three archaeologists. She's now in Mexico with most of the Australians we know at the moment, TJ. It's, it's actually getting full up with Australians there. I'll probably have an outlet for Foster's beer, they said. What we found is that primarily we found three archaeologists and TJ's one, and we're using her in our next online conference where we're talking about overseas and we're going to do some stuff overseas too. What we're finding is around the world, this is part of a completely different story, but the differences in Australia, the archaeology here has come from a country where there is no metal blade. So none of this stuff can be dismissed as, oh, this happened 20, 50, 200 years ago, 250 years ago. It can't be. I mean, this last one I'm going to hold up now, I'm going to hold this up now. This looks interesting because there's the letter A on it. And it's been cut. And if you look very carefully inside, you won't be able to see it today. There is a very fine cut that runs right through the middle, all the way through that letter. And then when you turn to another side, you've got different languages there. Different forms of language on that this side again. And this is a woman's rock to be held in the left hand like this. And this is a man's rock. And these two rocks I've just held up, I believe, are the two most important rocks in, this, in the planet. So there's the first part of this story. Now, the second part of this story is where it gets difficult. Because, yes, the aliens, the Pleiadians were here for quite some time. We've got them. 
we've got their skulls. And the government knows about it. They know we have this skull at the moment. And amongst the thousands, well, literally dozens of letters I've got and threats, we got a letter at the end of last year from the Australian government. It was called an official letter of warning. And what they told us simply was this. We have more than enough evidence to put you in jail. Uh, I'm going to be put in jail for three years, and it's a $1 million fine. They've made that clear in all the letters, haven't they, Evan? Yes. It used to be either or, didn't it? It did, yeah. And then it became both. I was six months or two and a half, three years, and it was going to be 250 to one, 750 and it ended up being three years and a $1 million. Now, they got that. I've got that at the moment. And what they've said is this. What they said in the letter is we have all the information we can to put you in jail, but we've decided not to. And I felt like I should have got on my knees and thanked them. But then the next paragraph they said then, they said this, but we reserve the right at any time in the future to resume proceedings against you. So what that was for me was a shut-up letter. Keep your mouth shut and we'll leave you alone. Well, we kept talking and now we've been completely banned by um, Facebook, shadow banned, and we can't get to anyone. So they're still working on it. But the point that gets really interesting in this story is this. Those rocks, from a technological viewpoint, are amazing. But that's not their major quality. The rocks are also magic. And this is the part where we really upset the archaeologists because we have seen what these rocks and what these rings and what the skulls can do, and they can do things and are still doing things as we speak. When the ceremony at Uluru took place two years ago, the summer solstice there, the change that began, we were asked to take about 70, 70 of these rocks to Uluru and set them up in formation, which we did. The ones I held up, I just showed you then, all went there. And they are part of this change. Now, what's interesting with these rocks is when you put them in formation and you sit people inside, something happens. Oh, wow. Now, we've known about this for a while. Two years ago, the rock said to me, start putting people inside and doing ceremony. And I thought, well, until then, I hadn't. I'd only ask elders to do ceremony. I wasn't doing it with the public. They insisted. So we did. And we've done it with a lot of people. And they come away shaking their heads and their eyes are glowing and all sorts of things. But I've never, and I'm not allowed to ask them what their story is because it is their story. Okay? Yeah, I, I'm going to get to TJ in a sec. Evans just remind me to involve TJ. TJ, I realize he talks. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're not forgotten. I'm I, leading up to it now. I, I do oh, want to ask it. one question. Mm. Why do you think that they're so afraid of letting people know that there's another history storyline? Why, why do you think? Because obviously there's an Atlantic. I mean, I watched one of your videos that showed the Egyptian influence mm. in yeah. Australia. So, yeah. so, I mean, there's, there's all these other stories that could be, could be told about different species of humans that it, whether it was experiments until they got yeah. it right, South Africa, there are the gold mining. I mean, mm. There's all these different species of humans. Why is everyone so, um, why, why is the storyline so important to keep it in Afri Africa as the origin? Because if you put it in Australia, you have to include aliens, you have to include magic, you have to include a completely different narrative of who we are, our evolution, and everything we believed we thought was true is false. It resets the whole of how humanity came about through uh, a cross fertilization with Pleiadians and others, which explains why we're the only animal on this planet that has 7 billion faces and none of the same, 7 billion bodies and none of the same, because our genetic our genetic start is not two mummied uh, monkeys that made, by the way, all monkeys don't have sutures and all hominids do. So somehow these two mummy, mummy and daddy monkey made beings that were nothing like them. Well, that's not true, but this explains all of these things. And it makes you question whether everything we're doing today makes any sense and it's wrong. 
and it basically calls into question everything we're doing and holds it up against something that is much better and it pales by comparison. So people have fought against this. That's the main reason. You see, the problem is when <coughs> I did this with the rocks for a while and we've had two places that were set up on Ram and Jerry country, we're going to put the whole rocks in formation and people were going to sit inside them. The government stole an island off the Ram and Jerry that was theirs and took it off them and kicked them all off. And this culture centre was there and they all agreed to do it. And we couldn't do it. Then a, a, a multi-millionaire gave us some land in Ram and Jerry country, three acres overlooking the ocean. He's now in jail. He's been in jail for six months and hasn't been charged yet. And the people who've been given the land now are being told under no conditions you're allowed to do whatever he was going to do. So what happened is every time we tried to put these rocks on country, and I'll tell you why this, they don't want them on country, because when we do put them on country, they work. Now, they stopped that twice. And I believe because we ramped up the stories on the rocks and we've done an experiment with the rocks, which I'm going to lead up to, then I want to go to TJ. I haven't forgotten that, Evan. Oh, poor TJ. We did this and they know because what actually happened was we started doing workshops. We're going to film the next workshop and show people overseas, right? And if you're in Australia, you can come to them. And in these workshops, what I've done is I created, we had, um, we only have eight people at one time and we keep them for about three and a half, four hours. Uh -huh. And then we did that four times. So we had 32 people in all, 34 actually, because we overbooked. And what actually we I did was I wrote up a, what you would call a sheet. And in it were a series of questions. And the questions were based around, I didn't want to know the content. The first set of questions was this experience directed towards mind, soul, or body. And it was from one to 10. Manner of contact, hair stand on end, vision, voice, telepathic contact, chills, heat. I don't know why I wrote that. Energy waves from the circle. Type of message, a premonition, sensation of well-being, wisdom shared, energy inflow charging the body, charging the soul, and charging the mind. And I asked them to answer it. Then I was worried because The Rock said they wanted to do this because they said, we want to work with people now. And what had happened was I'd actually done this with some kids around here. They were opening up a new school, and I said, I'll give them a rock ceremony. And some of the parents came up and told me about what the kids were like after they sat inside the circle, and I realised this works for anybody. Some of the stories I heard about one kid that after he sat in there for five minutes, he went out, went down to a creek and cried his eyes out and then was given all these visions. And when I saw the kid when he came back, it was not the same child that walked into the rock. Who came out of there was a young man. And the woman said this. She said, my, my son's changed completely. That five minutes has changed him completely. It was funny because his brother went in later on and he apologised to me because I had about 11 kids lining up for an hour and a quarter and they just sat there and waited. They didn't do a thing. The rocks had got them. And this kid said when he was going, he said, I'm going to apologise before I go in because I wriggle all the time. The teachers told me to do that constantly. I said, ah, yes, but you're not going with a teacher this time. He sat in there for five minutes and didn't move and he was so proud and I patted his shoulder and said, you did well, didn't you? He said, I didn't wriggle. I said, I know. I saw that. He said, oh, but the rock said, no, no, don't tell me that. So this time we did. And this is what's interesting. 34 people filled this out. And of those 34 people, one person got no reaction. I was pleased about that because that person actually didn't buy a ticket. Someone else had the ticket and couldn't come, and they just rang up their friends. And when they come, we're going to do rock ceremony, and they were supposed to bring gloves. These people didn't bring gloves because they knew nothing. And this person did three other things during the time we're there that made me realise that she shouldn't have been there. So I was pleased she got nothing. She wrote one for everything. Every other person there made an entry. Energy waves coming from the circle, I had 33 out of 34 said they felt energy coming off the circle of rocks. That was amazing. Of the scores I got for where it contacted, uh, we got 26 out of 33 said the mind, 28 out of 33 said the soul, and 26 out of 33 said the whole body. Everyone said one of them, okay? And the scores were normally 10 and 9. But what was fascinating is then we've got the other ones, but this is what blew me away. Manner of contact. Yeah, okay, 32 out of 33 got the energy waves. And then it was a mixture. And I remember putting in heat, and I thought, why am I putting that in? 11 of the 33 marked down 10 out of 10 for heat. Wow. 
the rocks laying on the ground. How can that be? Nine out of 33 mark 10 out of 10 for a vision. Seven mark 10 out of that group said they had a, a voice, telepathic contact, chills. They had something. Everyone had something. There were two people out of the whole group that scored numbers in the threes and fours. All the rest went above six for all of their scores. What we have here um, is undeniable proof, and I'm going to do this every time, of people saying, and here's the best part of this story, Kathy, because a lot of people are going to say, oh, they did this just to curry your favour, okay? And that's what they're going to say for sure because it's anecdotal. It's what people said. We made a guarantee. We told people, if you don't get a reaction, we're charging $150, 120 for our subscribers. If you don't get a reaction for that 10-minute session inside that rock, we'll give you back 50 bucks. No questions asked. If you just come up and say it didn't work, we'll give you $50 straight away. So it was in the interest financially of every person there to say, I got nothing. Give me 50 bucks. And we would have had to do it. We would have stood by it. Nobody did. The only person that didn't get a reaction, by the way, the partner did. But that one person who didn't said things that made me think you should not be here. And I'm not going to say what they are because that's not the point of it. What I'm getting at is that these rocks do actually work. And I know the government twice have blocked us, put one person in jail, six months, has not been charged. There were 50 police there, fully armed when they went to that place and they searched it for five hours and found after five hours, one gun that was loaded. That's it. That's, the, what, that's where he's broken, by the way. Imagine that happening in America and being put in jail for six months and not charged. He's still waiting to be charged. Wow. And I can tell you he's on a special uh, medicine for a condition he has, and he's now been given a new medicine by the jailers and the people are doing this, and he's getting sick all the time. And I can't go farther than that because oh, I don't God. think he's going to get out. He doesn't think he'll get out. He thinks he's going to die in jail very soon. Oh, my gosh. So, well, well, okay. Yeah. So, do you feel that this is so? So, uh, there's a couple of things. I'm hoping that either TJ or you guys will explain a little bit more about Uluru so that people that may not be aware of Uluru and its importance in the prophecies, mm -hmm. if, if we could talk about that, number one. Briefly, then I want to go to TJ because she's okay. been waiting here very pop. Okay. Uh, and, 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 I also, really shut up. <laughs> and I also want to know why you think you're the guardian of the rocks. Uh, well, we'll do the first one first because that's okay. an easy one. That ceremony that took place at Uluru was made by the elders. And I've got to tell you, Uluru is a, a big visitor site. It was closed down on the 21st. Everyone was kicked out at 10 o'clock and it was closed down the next day. They didn't want anyone in there. They had been doing ceremonies for nine years leading up to this one, and we we're told this particular ceremony will recharge the earth. And if people don't know, I can tell you the Schumann residence is just off the planet now. It's just kicking up all the time, and everyone knows that. That came about because of that ceremony. And what happened was this has been leading up for a long period of time. There were a series of crystals placed inside the rock. They don't come from here. Uh, I know Atlantis they used a series of crystals that came from some other planet, didn't they, Evan? Yep. These ones came from the Pleiades, and what they were there for, they were in a get-out-of-jail clause where if the planet was about to fall apart, which is what it's doing right now, we're destroying it in every possible way, this would charge the planet up so it would heal itself because if it didn't do it this way, it was going to do it another way, and everyone was going to suffer big time. This way the planet will heal itself, and every animal will be allowed to stay bar one. And the one that has to earn the right to stay is the one that made the mess, humans. Humans. Right? They don't get an automatic pass to, to join the planet. The planet is ascending. The energy of this planet and the vibration of this planet is going to stay locked at a high level forever. The planet will ascend. It will no longer become a, a kindergarten. It will become a university of magic and love. And if you are not qualified to be part of that, you will then not incarnate again. That's the rule. The story was that that first ceremony, when that happened, people had to make their mind up about whether they believed, if they want to walk down the road of fear, of warfare, of pandemic, of hatred, 
of not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, that is one path that's on offer. The Mayans told us there would be two roads. The second road is now open. But it's a road of faith because we can give you a lot of circumstantial evidence that's empirical, but you've still got to put together the story to what it means. And if you don't want to believe it, you don't have to. I mean, on that day, we filmed the UFO hovering over the top. On that day, we filmed Uluru exploding with energy at 7.36, and we've got it on our website. You can go and look at it. You will see there's a flash of light that comes out of the hole of the sky but does not touch the rock. I saw that. Yes, it came out of the rock, and the people who filmed it never saw it until they found it later. The people who filmed the UFO just hovering above, they never saw it either. These were discovered later. They left behind clues, and we've got all the clues up for people who want to see it. It's on our website. There is a couple of articles there where you can watch all the evidence. So we have that in abundance. That was the purpose. But our understanding is all great ceremonies have in threes. There has been a second solstice, and there will be a third one at the end of this year at Uluru. Our understanding is that humans have to make a decision about where they stand and upon which road they stand by that time. Okay. And after that point, when that solstice takes place, which locks in with a, an eclipse of the moon and an alignment with Uranus, which is the planet of sudden change, each person has to make a commitment. And if they're not committed to move forward, they leave the planet and they don't come back until their soul has evolved. Now, they're not going to hell, ladies and gentlemen. They're going to a planet that vibrates at the level this planet used to vibrate, where they can get the things they got wrong right. And remember, my take is around 85% of the people on this planet will not stay. Wow. And 15% will, 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 will stay. But what about the person who's 15.0001% that missed out by one word and one deed? Do they go to the same place as Suros and Gates and others? And the answer is no, they do not. They have one more thing to sort out, then they can incarnate and come back here. So some people are on leave. Sometimes it's permanent, sometimes it's not. So that's basically what that's about. And then set, what I am going to lead up is to our online conferences and call in TJ in a sec, but I'll answer your second question. Why have we got the skulls, the rings, the metal objects, the rocks and all those things here? There's a lot of answers for that one. Um, there you go. Oh, God. Look, very simply, um, I think the reason is, and I want to make this point now, it's not because I'm evolved. In fact, I'm going to be brutally honest to say that I'm not convinced I'll be in the 15% that stays. I've got a lot of baggage, so it's not for that reason. There are people that are far more evolved than I am and wiser about stuff than I am. But I think I was chosen for one reason, because I will fight for something. And when the government threatened to put me in jail, I said, come on, let's do it. I'll go to court with you. When people are threatened to kill us, which they have, often, same reaction. When we've been cursed, and of course, Evan, as he boasts all the time, has been cursed nine times. I've only been cursed eight times. It makes no difference. If they want to, because I hide the rocks in, in our rainforest. Evan and my wife don't know where they are. And if they want to kill me, they can. But I won't tell them where it is. That's why I got the job. Not because I'm enlightened, not because I'm evolved on none of those things, but I will fight. And I think what they wanted was not an evolved being. They didn't want the Dalai Lama. They wanted a warrior with some degree and only a minuscule degree of what's right and wrong. No other reason than that. Not because I'm special, not because I'm aware, because I will fight for these rocks. I, I mean, I'm original. They're my tribe. And people ask me, where's your tribe? And I do know where my tribe is, but I never nominate it because blackfellas in this country, all they ever do is fight each other. Therefore, if I belong to a tribe, I can't go into some country because I'll say, oh, we're fighting with them. If my tribe is the rocks, no one fights with me. I can get to go everywhere. So that's why I've got that. And, of course, that leads into what we've been doing. We've been doing, apart from the, um, apart from the workshops we're doing each month, and we're going to film one for people overseas. We'll put that up. We're going to try and film the next one. It goes for four hours because it's a long workshop, okay? And we have people going inside with gloves and they touch the rocks and they play archaeology and try and work out what's there. We do that a couple of times. We have them sitting inside the circle for 10 minutes and we have them coming back. We have people moving from both sides all the way through. Well, watch all that. 
They won't get to see people sitting inside the circle because that's their business and they can't do that. But at the end, what we do is we take the camera inside the circle for 10 minutes and we lay it there so they can sit inside there from a distance. And the second part of what we're doing is we're doing online conferences. And what we're doing there is we're doing them up until January, uh, sorry, December this year. Okay. Because the third solstice is in December this year. And that's it. We told people when we did this, we did about seven leading up and got people to know about it. And we, as you know, in the finish, we had 15 million people meditating on that night. And that is why, see, the elders turned the rock on, but it would have idled. We, we knew the rule was this. We're told at the start we had to get a certain number of people around the world meditating to send that rock to spread it throughout the whole planet. And we exceeded that by a factor of 10. We were told the exact number that was needed. And I remember the time thing, we won't get it. Well, that part was wrong. So now we're in a situation now where we're doing online conferences now. And TJ's just gone, but I'm about to call her in so she'll hear this. Oh, she's back. Oh, she came back then. <laughs> and what we do each time is we bring in a couple of people to talk about different aspects of the change and what's taking place and what happened in the past because we are following the Hopi prophecy of the blue kachina, and we've read this many times. And the blue kachina, the prophecy says that people must find the old teachings and believe them. And if you don't believe them, you don't stay. It's that clear. The Hopi made it clear time after time, and so did our elders. And all the indigenous people of this planet have said the same thing, right? So what we've done each time and this is where I'm going to stop talking so TJ gets a couple of minutes at least. Dear God, <laughs> thank God for that. It's what we've done each time is we've picked people from, for different aspects. right? And we, last time we had all elders, okay, all elders from Australia. And every now and then we go, because remember, this ceremony was not an Australian ceremony, but a global ceremony. Right. And we're following the Hopi, we're following the Mayans. And, of course, that brings TJ in because at the moment a lot of her work was done in America. Right. And of course, now that we're really focusing in on the hobby and what they've got to say, and I've got to tell you this that each indigenous per group were given the custodianship of one part of the message. And who were given the prophecies? The hobby. Any prophecy, prophecy, genuine prophecy from the hobby is correct. And they made it clear the red kachita would be in the sky. And we've got pictures of him. You can see him up there. And the blue Katrina, the two of them will be in the sky in the north and southern hemisphere. We've got pictures of them coming up too. So what we've asked TJ to do, and I'd like her to now just to give a bit of a taste of what she's going to talk about, is I really am fascinated by what's taking place in America because I believe that our closest cousins, because as you probably know, the Amer original people in America way before the second wave came in, which were welcomed and we bred with them. We were there a long period of time. And when the other group came in, they followed the same teachings that we gave them. You see, there's always been two types of teachings on this planet, indigenous, old way, and then sedentary, new way. And we've always been in conflict. We go for a while the sedentary way with Atlantis and it blows up, then we go back to indigenous walking with the land becoming spiritual then we go back and fight the, the land again and we've been doing this time after time so tj i'm going to shut up now before everyone falls asleep you want to tell us a bit about what you're going to talk about next time thank you um no and i i love listening to everything you have to share so i think it's really important i'm just honored to be able to join in here and um, do have my little bit of input. Um, yeah, so I'll, I will be joining the next um, Our Alien Ancestry Conference. And really what Stephen has invited me to speak about, Stephen and Evan, is um, first of all to um, speak a little bit about my, I guess my work and um, relationship as sort of like student and mentor with the late Dr. Carmen Bolter, who was the creator of the amazing, what I think was a really groundbreaking, eye-opening, controversial uh, docu-series for Egyptology and just arch and 
the distant past, the you know archaeology of the distant past. It's called the Pyramid Code. So I will be speaking about her work, and um, and you know and and the work that we did together. I was helping her at one point because um, not only do I have a background in archaeology, I started delving into uh, filmmaking and documentary making, and I do have a documentary out there called Ancient Tomorrow. So after I finished that, I reached out to Dr. Carmen Bolter because uh, she was one of the experts that really, actually one of the few experts that not only was a woman, but was openly speaking about the divine feminine and this lost knowledge within the ancient cultures and human technology on the planet. Um, and, and that's just like unseen in mainstream archeology span and it's been erased in a lot of ancient texts, namely the Bible and the Old Testament. Um, so to have that, to have someone outspoken about it, challenging, was so refreshing for me as not just a woman in archeology, span um, but as someone who's willing to step out of the mainstream what I will call a very patriarchal based narrative about our human origins and our past. So, um, and, and really it, it ties. My toddler just walked in. <laughs> oh, come on in. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. My husband's about to feed him anyway. Um, no, I was going to say it ties into these hidden histories of our origins because there is a very matriarchal aspect and narrative to our human origins, I believe. Even, okay, so in my background in archaeology, I worked extensively in the field with Native Americans out of the West Coast of California. Um, a particular site that I worked on had what's very similar to what Stephen and Evan have in their hands that are very mystical stones with what I would call workings on them that just do not fit, do not fit in the, the, the technology of the other artifacts that they had produced and the other features of their society. And this is going back, uh, what we dated the village, it was, a, it was a coastal village. It was going back 4,000 to 8,000 years along the coast of Southern California, literally like LA County and Orange County. Um, so it's a very populated area now, but there was a swath of land there that uh, was untouched. It was actually a wetland. So it really was, had a lot of had a lot of um, material, cultural material preserved. And one of the things we found there were these charm stones. We called, they were called charm stones by the natives who are the Tongva and uh, the Gabrileño people and the, um, the Hachaman tribes. And they just didn't fit. They basically had etchings. Uh, there was no, obviously there was no metallurgy back then. This was before any you know, metal age and it just didn't fit. And they had random, they called them magical religious objects. And they were made of the hardest materials, granite, granitic materials. So I'm just gonna give a quick summary and snapshot from my experience and from what Carmen also uncovered in Egypt is that these stones, one thing they have as a common denominator is their silica content. So that's crystals. They have a crystalline structure. And um, Stephen, remind me again the, the material of these stones that you have with the markings. Yeah, all of them have, the, 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 the rocks we're talking about with these markers have a shirt, which is silica, and a resin coat on top. And a resin coat on top. Okay, so yeah, when you have a lot of these stones, when you have uh, some silica content, that means they contain crystal. And it's not 
like the typical crystal, like quartz crystal that is a fully formed crystal lattice. However, the fact that it still has some crystal content, I think is significant because um, I'm trying to summarize everything that I'm fascinated about, about all this and why the dots connect is because we know that there's a piezo, this word always is so hard to pronounce, piezoelectric effect when it comes to crystals, which means it can generate an electrical charge. Now, humans, whether they're, I believe, Homo sapiens sapiens or some other older hominid species are electrical beings, biologically. We're electrical beings. So I find that, and, and you know, this was Carmen Bolter's work. Really, I, I cannot speak highly about what she produced in the Pyramid Code. And my heart breaks that her untimely passing meant that we're not able to see the next extension, or potentially we are, that's kind of one of my side missions is to see how we can get her next series out, which is called The New Atlantis, because she was speaking to all these other experts about, look, the, you know, there definitely was a connect, like there definitely was an, a more ancient, uh, obviously you've got Atlantis and Lemuria, and there's anomalous archaeology and features all over the planet. And it connects, it's like a grand microchip, you know, massive megalithic monuments, they all contain silica content in their stone. And many of them are built on top of water bodies, whether it be an aquifer or was close to a river or was close to some other water body. You know, Lake Titicaca is next to Teotihuacan. The Giza Plateau, it was actually right along the Nile River at one point and has subterranean aquifers. Um, many megalithic uh, structures in the world were near bodies of water. So what do, you com what, what do you have when you combine a potential for piezoelectric effect, which is electrical charge, and running water? You, you kind of are starting to build a circuit here. And what's the missing, to me, and this is the part that's really hard to do archaeology in, what's the missing... Um, link um, is initiated human technology, spiritual technology, a sacred science that was being practiced by high level initiates. This is what Carmen talked to, talks about in the Pyramid Code. And this, I believe, was not only lost, it was um, marginalized, it was purposely covered up, destroyed. This was a knowledge, a discipline, a multi-discipline, uh, how could I say, like a level of education that ancient groups, ancient cultures had that went underground. During probably Atlantis, for sure, after Atlantis submersion was destroyed, um, and then resurfaced in ancient pre-dynastic Egypt. But then because of the warring elites during that time, uh, the patriarchy won over the matriarchy and it went underground. And I believe some of that knowledge was transported to Australia. That is what we're seeing. That's why we have these anomalous artifacts. It, to me, this is how the picture kind of comes together for me. And it's very hard archeology span to conduct. It costs a lot of money, you're worn down by different governmental agencies to even try and conduct these kind of studies. And you're also, you know, demonized by academia. You're, I mean, I, I caught that when I was doing Ancient Tomorrow, which is my documentary that looks at the ancient megalithics of the uh, monuments of the world and how they kind of create a circuit. They're all along ley lines. They're all along high energy vortex points of the earth, which is earth energy. That's the other factor. Earth energy plays a big part. These rocks have a resonant frequency. If we study the resonant frequency of these rocks, which is what happens in the stone circle ceremony, the workshops that they're doing, you are able to collect data. You can quantify. But this is a kind of woo-woo sort of thing that falls under pseudoscience. That's, um, you know, that as of recent years is totally, um, like I said, you become demonized, ostracized, 
you're hunted down, your reputation destroyed, blah, blah, blah. However, I believe right now we are definitely, it doesn't matter how powerful they are, the, Hop, the Hopi, the Mayans have all predicted this time. We're just falling in line into the time and the age where it is inevitable that this knowledge will come out. What Stephen and Evan's movement and mission are is so important right now. Because if anyone has right now in the world has reached a choice point of whether you've woken up to the lies of the world, you're aware of the matrix and how you don't want to be a part of it, and you want to create your own conscious co-creation, co-creative communities and systems that make you a freer sovereign, that allow you to be a sovereign being, that allow you to tap into forgotten uh, senses. This is something talked about in the Pyramid Code, a uh, Hakim, an ancient wisdom, Giza wisdom keeper from ancient Giza. He is an indigenous native of the Giza Plateau. You don't hear about Egypt, I'll just talk about indigenous people from Giza. They don't, they're caught up in the whole elite high tower, you know, um, elitist academics that just, they're armchair archeologists, Egyptologists that carry on and on and on about Egypt's grandeur, never consulting the ancient Sufi wisdom keepers who are right there. And then when you speak to them, what's the first thing they tell you? Ancient Egypt was a matriarchal culture. They didn't have five senses. They had 360 senses. They didn't view death as death and the end and you gotta bring all your material stuff with you. They viewed it as transcendence, that sort of thing. So, I mean, this is the beauty of what, this is the legacy of what Dr. Carmen has left with us. Unfortunately, even within amongst these experts, there can be a lot of um, energy, competing energy as well with the theories and um, yeah, and like what the research has, what the research was. And I think that has a lot to do with the patriarchy and how they wear us down even in the modern day because of agencies and protocols and bureaucracies in order for us to do proper research. Um, but I really feel like, you know, it's so good what you're doing, Kathy. It's so good what you're, the guys at Forgotten Origin are doing because it gives us hope that we can create this new and better way to understand not just our origins, but how we can move for, forward in the future. So anyway, that's, um, I'll leave it at that. I hope that gives some idea. I'm really excited about the conference and, um, you know, uh, sharing about it more. One real quick thing, I am going to release an, um, I'm going to preview an unreleased footage that I have of Carmen that I dug up that I did. Guess when? December 21st, 2012, at when she was at Palm Springs at the CPAC convention. I interviewed her. I didn't go to the convention. I forgot what happened. It was so last minute. She said yes to an interview. Marco, my husband and I went there got an interview from her before she was about to fly out. I even drove her to the airport. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna share that. And it's amazing some of the stuff she shared and it's so relevant now. This is how many years ago, 10 years ago. It is so relevant now, her message. So I'm excited to um, share that on the conference. So please grab your tickets, make sure you're there, share this and definitely um, you know, have hope that as long as we keep spreading this message and tapping into our, uh, our origins and really listening to the deeper truth that we're unlimited, we have unlimited potential. And we even have the potential to keep learning more, even, even if the mainstream is like, you know, like juggernaut down this agenda of destruction and control. Um, the, the, the prophecies have been foretold. So, and it's really playing out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I hope you we so haven't much. taken up too much time. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Evan, did you have anything so, else you wanted to Evan, say? Evan, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Oh, we've got a bit of an echo there. Um, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Echo there. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, we do. I don't hear yeah, it. Do. Oh. As it just us that's got the echo? I'll turn my mic off. Ah, ah. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah. Just a bit okay. of yeah. feedback. Yeah, no, just um, we'll 
put some links up for the next uh, conference. It's it's definitely going to be a good one. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to do a little bit about um, some of the overseas influences in Australia as well. Well, we changed it. We yeah. were going to do actually what was called, we've been attacked for doing woo-woo stuff, which is the stuff we spoke about earlier. But yeah, no. And I was going to do that, but we're going to change it around a bit. And um, because uh, we're going to do some stuff that links a bit to overseas, and we're also going to look at, I'm going to talk about the rocks a bit more too. Um, and I'm going to talk about, uh the results we've got there and i want to make some points about this some interesting things that came out of it so we're going to we're going to focus on that a bit more and the one we're going to do about magic we're going to move that back one primarily we changed the magic one i want to do all of it but i want to yeah well we were going to do that but because (laughs) we've been faced we've been so banned on everywhere on facebook everywhere um I, I want to actually explain to people why we were banned and what we were trying to do with the rocks and what we've got to with the rocks and why they did that. Because people would say, well, why would they bother doing this? I honestly believe if we had our way, the rocks would be in the ground now and people would be lining up, lining up, because we, we, we're going to set it up in a place where I'm going to charge $10. So anyone could afford it. And I swear to you, we would have had people lining up day after day just to sit inside there for 10 minutes. Because what it will do to people, it will make them it'll make them walk on the right road. Well, you know, you is know all about. that all of this energy work, I, I've been doing this for 21 years and I've worked with amazing healers all over the world. And this digital model of using Zoom or or I don't know if StreamYard's the same, but I know Zoom can capture, video can capture frequency. So what I would like you to do is go in the middle of the rocks and film from there for the rest of us. Yeah. And we did it once before when we did the second ceremony. We put and we had people writing back to us all over the world saying it worked. Oh. And we know we know it worked. We wouldn't put this up just to fill in 10 minutes just for the sake of it. We're doing it because we tried it before and then people contacted and said, I got a reaction from that. So we are aware of that. So it's not as good as sitting inside the rocks. I can guarantee you now that now, but it's not a bad second best. It will get you there and you'll get to see the rocks. You'll get to see and you'll spend that 10 minutes there. And we tried it before. So you're right about that. It does work. um, And that's why we're going to do that. And um, we'll we'll make that much. It'll be, we, we haven't worked out a price for it, but it won't be like for the people doing it live. Because we're going to feed them, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Evan, do you feel the energy? I mean, obviously, Stephen has um, created a trust relationship with the Indigenous mm-hmm. and, and has been doing this for so long. How do you, if you're a different generation, how do you experience all of this? Um, <laughs> he yeah. gets on well with the killing rocks. Yeah, yeah. Fun, funny question. That's why he's laughing. Rabbit's um, still in Binky's Evan. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, no, I there's a couple of rocks that we use to kind of deflect curses, uh-huh. um, but they have a better relationship with me because they know he can turn them off. Oh, yeah. Whereas they sense my inner frustration of like I'm minding my own business, I get cursed again. <laughs> Sometimes over Facebook of all things. So how postmodern is that? Um, so every time I walk past them and they're like whispering to me i'm like oh man it's always like we'll take care of that problem oh yeah they'll take care of it yeah they will (laughs) so i that's my kind of um relationship with them i can't actually touch um any of the rocks um except for one yeah except for one that's by my um bedside table um which is a healing rock which we've used on several people um to great result um so that's kind of like my guardian uh, rock that sits there so that's kind of my uh, relationship I mean I, I, I have a more extensive relationship when it comes to the metaphysical and some of the sites I was lucky or unlucky enough to walk into one cave after class Donna gave us some points of interest to research and um, yeah an owl flew out left me a feather I'm like oh cool I love owls I got a feather but 
I actually got cursed for that one. Um, three years. Yeah, for about three years. Um, even though we, yeah, we didn't, we weren't able to smoke ourselves uh, because the elder at that time um, was sick. So we used a different ceremony. So that's how we got around to not actually dying. Um, so, yeah, no, I definitely have a, uh, not as strong as Steve, a um, relationship with the artifacts and, and just the, uh, system of uh, spirituality and metaf- metaphysical as- elements of the world as well. So, <laughs> um, it's so a I have a question. So right now those rocks are right in front of you and you would have to wear gloves to touch them. Is that yep. what you're saying? You can't touch them. Yep. They're killing. And, and honestly, look, we've had people who've picked up rocks, haven't we, Evan? Yeah, so what yeah. happens is... <laughs> People pick the rocks up. Think, yeah. think of Lord of the Rings. I think told of, them that. Um, Gollum, Smeagol. Oh, it, it told me to touch it. Oh, yeah, but <laughs> haven't you seen the film? And they sort of look at me. Yeah. No, look, the rocks have killed people. We've brought people back that were had cancer through the whole of their body, had 20, 30 kilos of loss. They were grey, and they they've held the rock in their hand when they've and I've caught them with it. And I said, "What are you going to do, Mister? Not me." I said, Kano on the rocks, but not me, and you've got a problem. They will kill. My wife, see this rock here? This is Rosa's rock number one, the important rock. She actually was painting it because she's a professional painter. She's won quite a few contests. And she made the mistake of just touching it with a finger to get a better angle. And I was two rooms away, and she screamed out in pain. I said, you've touched the rocks, haven't you? The rocks told me straight away she touched them. She said, yes, and I ran in there. And she had a pain running up her left arm. And I did ask her recently, give a score out of 10 for it. 10 being agonising, laying on the ground and one a dull throb. She said it was an eight. It was running up her arm. It would have gone up into her arm and gone into her heart and killed her. And she's my wife. And the rocks know it's my wife, but it's a men's rock. She's a woman. And nobody, the elders have made this clear. The elders made this, not us, not me particularly. They're the ones who made the rule, didn't they? Yeah, they yeah. said nobody but me can touch the rocks. Now, if the rocks tell me since Kano's gone, I've now got so, so called before that Kano was my boss. If the rocks say to me someone, an elder comes along, there might be a rock that's made a comment like, I want that, that person can hold it, and I'll let them hold it. But even they're strict. I'll give you one very quick example of what happened. We had a person who's writing songs about the rocks. And I said, yes, you can sit inside for 10 minutes. That's a very specific number. And I've been told that's the number. Anyway, I left her because when people are between the rocks, I don't want to get in their way. And I was going on a time of 10 minutes and I was about to go walk out to get her and there was a phone call. My wife said, there's someone there. And I said, look, I can't right now. I've got to go and sort something out and told them that. But that meant I'd now go and over the 10 minutes. When I walked outside, she was walking out of the rocks. Oh, I was about to get you out. She said, well, you don't have to. They told me to get out. And they said it like that, get out. In other words, she had about five seconds of move, or they would have turned on her because they're addicted to protocol. These were made in ancient times when they were given ceremony. And for a long time when I first had these rocks, I made mistakes with them, and I can tell you, they punished me. I, they nearly killed me twice. Threw See, me down. There was a point in time when everyone could touch them. They weren't turned on. Yeah. There was a point in time when they were turned on and we were there that day and all sorts of weird things were happening. Oh, mate. Like, uh, Cameras were, there was electricity shooting out of rocks. There were machines that were going off. We had a camera that was shaking on one side there. It was chaos. It was really unbelievable. And our elder, Kano, had just passed on. He came in on that day and just turned them all on. And since that point, that's when the rules were made. Nobody but me can touch Because I still have friends that had come before then going, oh, I remember when I got to touch them all year, but they weren't active then. They weren't active then. They were inert. So. In fact, I went to that meeting and I was with the elders and the elders said, well, you're the one who's got to find out the information. I said, I've got nothing. We had about 80 people there. I said, I've got nothing whatsoever. I can't tell you anything except, look, technologically, this don't work, right? That's all I could say. I said, but I don't know their true story. And I said, what I want today is I've got elders here. What about today if we break the rules and we let them touch it for just for a while and we get out information? And the elders went off and had a meeting, didn't they? And they came back. And I'm doing a two-day conference on the workshop on the rocks. And they said to me, we've made a decision. No, 
No one's allowed to touch them. I said, well, I said, this is going to be an awful short two-day meeting because I haven't got that much. And then after I started, Umbalara stood up, didn't she? Yep. She said, Kano has just spoken to me. And he said, until 12 o'clock today, anybody, and I just thought the, the elders, white or black, can touch the rocks for the next up until 12 o'clock. And about four people then held the rocks and then they gave us amazing stories about the rocks when they held them because the rocks gave up their stories. And at, at that 12 o'clock time, the rocks were taken off them and it went back to the old rules again. And that's wow. how they've stayed. Wow. And to this day now, because they've become stronger as the change is getting closer, the impacts are becoming more dramatic. Um, with our, as I said, with our online co uh, workshops now, as long as you are a person, I've said before, it's not a fault. If the rocks reject you, it means that you've got something inside yourself you have not resolved and you have to resolve it. They're warning you you're not ready. I like that lady who came when she made a statement within three minutes of us beginning the whole thing, didn't she, Evan? Yeah. And I thought, oh, my God. I looked at her and looked at the rocks and thought, this ain't going to work. I knew <laughs> that straight away. I thought, this is not going to work. Wow. But, wow. She, but it, it, what they did is when they came there, because before they would punish people, but she didn't touch them, right? So they're not going to kill her. They just gave her nothing because she wasn't ready. But all the others, I mean, some people, their comments were words can't describe what happened. And that was a common comment when there's a little bit right down the bottom about the session. A lot of people said that. And it was interesting. One of the two people who got middle scores said, I still, I've, I've got to learn to relax more. She was saying herself, this is why I didn't get, I got contact, but it's my fault that we didn't get more. But she still got some contact. So, yeah, these rocks now want to basically heal people from within as long as they're prepared to be healed. And if you're not, well, you shouldn't come. And we sort of, that's why we made this guarantee. If you don't get any from that, we'll refund you because we know um, we're only doing this for one reason, really. It's not for the money. I, I, Evan and I, when we were told this by the rocks, the rings and, and the skull, they all said this together, we both didn't want to do it. We don't want people coming up to our farm. That The whole point was to go, well, Ramajari country is 3,000 k's from where we are, and that's where I wanted it. I want people coming up here. I live in the back of the road. I've always looked away from people. But my wife didn't want it. I didn't want it. Evan didn't want it. But the rocks did. And guess what we've all learned? <laughs> they, they get the final say here. And because if you don't agree with them, yep. they will punish you. So now I have to make cakes for people. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the so trick with these things. When they, they give us, I, they, they basically let me know when they want things done and I just do them. That's my job here. As I said, I don't have, I don't have inspirations, any inspirations. It's the rocks telling me this is what we're going to do because people say, oh, it's a great idea of yours. It's not my idea. If I had any say in this, you wouldn't be here. But they've got every say in it. So, yeah, we, we understand. It's all but great. they have the wisdom of the ages inside them and now they want to share it. Um, and I, now that we've done this the first time, and even when we were doing it, we really weren't sure what was going to happen. I thought, well, maybe this is going to be a real dud because I never deliberately never asked people. I knew that people got affected, but I didn't know if it was just going to be one or two. I didn't know we we're going to get 33 out of 34. So that's what we're doing, and that's why I think to an extent we've announced this and we said we're going to do more. And then straight away, we've, we've always had a problem on Facebook. We've been sort of shadow banned a bit now. <laughs> now it's complete. We can't get anything out. I'll Even be glad to help you. I'll be glad to help you. So uh, that's how we do it. Yeah, yeah. we'll help each other. Yeah, we're, we're, we're powerful together. And this is the perfect timing. We're in a huge transition mm. time, and we're going from – uh, competition to collaboration, a whole different way of living, a whole different um, persona that has to be activated. And what, what these, the mystery schools have, their information has been held and it's time for it all to come out so that we can find our way back to a um, more peaceful way of living, more loving way of, and, and more um, equitable way of living because what's happened is we're so out of balance. And um, this age of Aquarius requires us to change. So I'm sure the rocks know that 
um, the pyra any of the pyramid information. I mean, there's ancient tools and um, mystery school information that's being uncovered every day now. And people were afraid to come out and share it. And now, now we're all being told, got to do it, got to, I mean, even the divine feminine that you talked about, TJ, so many brave, incredibly powerful women are coming out with the divine feminine. I interviewed someone today um, who's from Southeast Asia. She's living in Ecuador right now. Um, there's people that have lived in India. They're, they're, you're seeing this whole new group of people being activated. And I can't wait to hear more about the stones because I, I think I have to do this again because I want to know about the inner earth civilizations and all of this. I, I mean, there's so much information that needs to come out of how we can live in harmony. And I believe that the internet is training wheels for us to become telepathic because we're actually at that point now where we can think about somebody and we get an email or a phone call. That's happening all the time. And eventually we won't need the internet, but we have to clean up our concepts of self and other in order to be telepathic or else it's a mess. It's a mess, <laughs> right? It becomes um, matrimonial again. That's why the women are coming back now because their time has come again. The men have to stand back for a period of time. That's not forever, but in the transitional period when this change starts, there will be men who evolve that are ready but they still have some issues they've got to learn about women. They haven't still got rights. So for a period of time, I've been told by all the elders, they've even had arguments with some of the elders about this because they say there are men who are ready for this, but there are, but there will be men who will evolve that still have some baggage. They've got to let go, and they've got to let the women run the show for a period of time, and then they will merge into that organisation and that network. So yeah. that's what this change is about. So the women will become stronger now. And the men will learn, they will be allowed to advise, to urge, to prompt, but they can't vote. Wow. Yeah, they have to stop for a period of time. That's but part of this change. I do think that we are looking at, we don't really want this t seesaw type of thing. We want zero point. We want the, because as a woman business owner, I've had to have a lot of my divine masculine activated in order to do my work in the world so i'm at a balance too i mean all of us have to learn how to be working mm. from that that yep. middle ground so that's probably part of what the stones are doing oh they are they are and that's what that's why we're, we're doing that for the rest of this year but of course that finishes in december because after that we're hoping because the ram and jerry i've got together again the, trying for a third time to put these rocks down there and they're actually getting together right now and we've got a an elder from the ram and jerry will be uh, talking at our next um workshop about what they're doing so yeah we are going to get these rocks in country eventually but in the meantime they are on country once a month okay yeah okay well i i will um i i want to make sure that everyone knows the events that are coming up and yeah. let me um i will put them on the screen Let's see which one goes first. I don't know which one goes first. The green one? Does the green one go first? Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. That's, that's the one. Okay. So uh, this is very exciting as you, you've already gotten to hear from TJ, but there's, do you want to talk about anyone else, Evan? Yeah, so um, Paul and Phoebe hogan -Dyke, we've had them on before. So they um, were given... Um, greenstone um sacred um artifacts and they traveled the world um giving them out to different elders from different tribes including um the dogon tibet orkney islands that yeah, traveled story, the yeah. world and we did about half their story last time they're on but they ran out of time because it's such a a long and um, amazing story that we're going to have them back on to finish that up but it's also got that global focus um that is the theme 
And um, Leah and Dad will continue their question and answer sessions that they have every conference. Um, with Ms. Riff, with an alien Oswell guy. It's one of her guides. So um, there are always interesting questions um, and answers that um, we don't all often know oh, what the answer is going to be. Uh, so, yeah, it's definitely an interesting and conversation. And, and life. scary. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of scariness because there's a few times when we're just like, wow. And you there's know. nothing you can say. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, so it's going to be a really good um, conference. I'm really looking forward to um, TJ playing that interview with um, Dr. Mm. Cameron Balter too. So. Yes. Yes. Well, this the work that you all are doing is so fantastic. Thank you so much. And again, um, there's also uh, a, I do have a slide also for this event that is coming up in June. Do you yes. want to speak to this one real quick? Well, that's the one we'll be filming because a lot of the people we're talking right now won't be able to watch this. This is a longer version and there we've got... Darren, who's a Mac, who's a spokesperson for the Ramanjiri for Kano, and he's actually going to talk mainly about Kano, about what people would call miracles. I've seen Makano do magic on about seven or eight occasions, and every one of them involves what people would call a miracle. He's just going to talk. This it's well known around this country that he could do these things, and what I remember on one occasion when he disappeared in front of ourselves and Graham Hancock. Um, and Santa uh, down at Kangaroo Valley. And somebody asked him, somebody asked, a lot of people asked me to go up and ask you him. Ask, if you that. ask him, you're like, I'm not touching I'm not going near it. I'm not going near it. Someone did the next day and, and asked him, how is it possible you can disappear for a minute, then reappear like that? He said, it's simple. He said, everything I can do, every human on this planet has the potential to do, but they forgot it. I didn't. He said, there's a curtain. I can see it right now. Can't you? <laughs> Can't you see it? And the person said, no. He said, well, that's the only difference. Once you can see that curtain, then you'll see other things. So he's going to be talking about that, um, and that's the one we'll be filming. So that one, I deliberately did that because we've got a Ramanjiri person talking about Kano, and I wanted people to understand what he was like. So wow. that one we will be filming. Wonderful. And that's the workshop. And we want to make sure everyone knows uh, to go to Our Alien Ancestry Dot net and I'll have all of that information in the uh, description so that you can easily just click on a link and go there and read up on everything so that you don't miss this incredible opportunity. You'll know if you're called that this is something that is in, in perfect timing and divine timing for you. And we are so much more powerful than we know and it's time for us to step up to know to actively participate in the awakening and the change. So thank you all so much. Wow, we went a little over time, but we'll have to do this again, okay? Definitely. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you so much. And thank you, TJ. Wonderful to meet you. We'll we'll Welcome. talk again thank too. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm sorry we have to sign off, but. We'll talk again soon. Soon. Thanks, guys.